Okay, cool. If everyone's good, we can begin. Aditya and I negate the benefits of the International Monetary Fund do not outweigh the harms. Our sole contention concerns cutting social spending. Larry Lee of Science Direct finds in 2015 that the IMF provides financial assistance to countries only if they agree to implement tough austerity measures. Global Exchange confirms that the IMF ensures debt repayment by requiring countries to focus on repaying the IMF while cutting social spending in two sectors. First, cutting education spending. Anoop Shah of UMIS quantifies that in Africa, education spending decreased by 25% due to IMF programs. This is devastating. GP finds in 2016 that increased education access could reduce poverty by 30% by giving everyone the skills necessary to succeed. Second is cutting healthcare spending. Shaw furthers that IMF programs cut healthcare spending by 50%, and this is devastating because the UN finds in 2019 that investing an additional 1% of GDP on healthcare globally would save 60 million lives. The IMF has carried out these atrocities in three major regions of the world. First is Latin America. Manuel Pastor of SAGE finds that the IMF caused a crisis in Latin America due to its austerity projects, which resulted in millions heading into poverty. William Smith of the University of Miami finds that from 1982 to 1993, the number of people in poverty almost doubled with an increase of over 70 million. Second is Asia. The ASDN writes that the IMF hurt domestic economies through tight monetary policies and government budget cuts. In Thailand, Indonesia, and South Korea, the IMF transformed a small financial problem that could be resolved through debt restructuring into a full-blown economic crisis. Thus, Robert Dibby of the Indiana State University quantifies that during the Asian financial crisis, IMF policies caused a depression that pushed 200 million people into poverty. The third place is Africa. Malik Samba of the World Health Organization contextualizes that before IMF involvement, many African nations offered free medical services. But in the 1980s, many African nations decided to turn to the IMF who demanded severe healthcare cuts. Many governments that had to discontinue financial support to the health sector, leading to tens of thousands of doctors leaving the region, drug prices soaring, and a severe lack of medical equipment. Thus, he concludes that by the end of 1990, most African health systems collapsed, leading to the resurgence of many infectious diseases like malaria, tuberculosis, and cholera. Indeed, Julia Robinson of the University of Washington furthers that during Ebola, countries which had to de deal with IMF conditions found themselves struggling to respond. David Stuckler quantifies that disease mortality increased by 30% due to IMF involvement. But rather than learn from his previous mistakes, the IMF has simply doubled down during COVID. Oxfam writes in 2020 that despite over 500 organizations from over 85 nations urging the IMF to end austerity measures, 84% of the IMF's COVID loans mandate deep cuts to public health care systems, leaving millions more to be left without health care, thwarting any hope of a sustainable recovery. Soren Ambrose furthers in 2020 that the social spending cuts forced by the IMF during its surge of lending amidst the pandemic threatens to plunge countries into years of depression and a lost decade of development. Overall, it's for all of these reasons that James Vreeland of Yale University found that the cumulative effects of, all, of, of IMF programs cut economic growth by more than 40%. Stuckler furthers that IMF austerity programs have on net caused 4 million deaths, and William Easterly of NYU finds that IMF loans push 14 million people into poverty. Even the IMF nations themselves know the negative effects of programs. As Bretton Woods writes in 2018, that countries are almost forced into accepting IMF loans despite the clear, clear negatives in order to preserve international relations with other global powers. Because the IMF has proven to be detrimental and historically hurt the world's poorest, Aditya and I are proud to negate. All right, perfect. Can I just see one thing? It's the 4 million deaths on the bottom. For sure. It's sent. All right, I can start my constructive as soon as I see it in my email. All right, perfect, I got it.
Let me just get a sip of water. All right, so just to be clear, I'm Sion Mansur, speaking first for Carmel Valley on the affirmative. Is anybody not ready? <clears throat> All right, if everyone's good, I'm gonna start time now. Because the IMF is the firefighter of the developing world, Carmel Valley affirms the resolution. The benefits of the International Monetary Fund outweigh the harms. Contention one is liberalization. The IMF has enabled individual countries to take advantage of the investment opportunities offered by international capital markets. Masters 20 finds that IMF policies have included liberalizing trade and currency policy, removing barriers to investment and capital flows. Across recent decades, the IMF has sustained an increase in trade openness and a decrease in tariffs, as Bull 06 confirms that about three-fourths of IMF programs contain commitments to trade liberalization. Crucially, trade liberalization contributes to an increase in growth by increasing the incomes of the poor and creating jobs for unskilled workers. Welch 03 finds that countries that have liberalized have experienced increases in their annual rates of growth by 1.5 percentage points and investment rates by 2 percentage points. Dollar one terminalizes that by opening up their economies to the global economy, the number of people in poverty has declined by over 120 million. Contention two is social stability. The IMF has created social stability in two main ways. The first is tax reform. Escobar 18 explains that through IMF tax programs, such as rural development programs, countries have generated up to $42 billion. Without this tax reform, it would have been impossible to make peace agreements with the FARC rebels in Colombia, a place of refuge that killed 200,000 people and displaced another 6 million. The second way is through stabilization loans. The IMF alleviates tensions between governments and local ethnic groups. Soisa 15 explains that stabilization loans allow governments to buy off opposition from ethnic groups who might be encouraged to mobilize. Crucially, Denny 14 finds that since 1946, 64% of all civil wars have divided along ethnic lines. The desire of an ethnic group to gain political independence from the state makes ethnicity an inevitable feature of conflict. Besides millions dying in each conflict, Stanford 16 writes that civil wars lead to state fragmentation, an enormous amount of civilian casualties, which generates large-scale refugee flows and great powers in proxy wars, exacerbating conflict. Contention three is economic recovery. Julie 21 writes in mid-March that the developing world is currently facing a balance of payments and debt crises that upends developmental progress. As a result, Williams 20 finds that as many, many as 90 million people could be plunged beneath into extreme poverty. Fortunately, the IMF is spearheading recovery in two ways. The first is by increasing creditworthiness. Broom 08 explains that less developed economies can draw on the credibility of the IMF's institutional reputation as a way to signal to international audience that they are a safe investment. Increasing creditworthiness increases investment and makes it cheaper to borrow money by decreasing interest rates on the debt. Thus, OECD 2000 finds that poverty rates declined by an average of 20% under IMF-supported programs. The second way is by resolving liquidity shortages. Gabor 21 explains that special drawing rights, or SDRs, are a token system used by the IMF to provide influxes of cash to developing countries. In February, the IMF was given approval to allocate $500 billion in new SDRs to help ease recovery in poorer nations. Collins 20 finds that SDR allocations are favored to poorer nations, and as a result, low-income countries would be able to boost their international reserves by 20%. Countries can take these tokens and trade them in for unconditional cash, which is why Liao 21 finds that this additional financing source would give low-income nations more flexibility, whether that's through purchasing vaccines or restructuring their economy. For example, the Rolt 20 finds that the IMF's SDR allocations would give the Ethiopian government enough money to increase health spending by 45%. Main 20 contextualizes, a large issuance of SDRs is an easy and effective way to provide a major infusion of financial support to the countries that need it the most, saving millions of lives, and thus we affirm. Can uh, I'm ready for class, Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, we just like to see Escobar 18 and poverty rates declined by 20%. Sure.
All right, those have been sent. Cool. After I see them, we can begin crossfire. Perfect. All right, I just think I got it. So y'all can start cross whenever you're ready. Yeah, and you can have the first question since you spoke first. Cool. Let's talk about your argument on credit ratings. Why are credit ratings so low in the developing world right now? Um, usually because of crises like COVID right now cool. makes it so that investors are back high. Once we are able to solve the COVID crisis. No, I'm saying the when were they high? Before the COVID crisis? No, they weren't. They were low back then. That's no, like no. Compared evidence. to right now, yeah, so they were they were much yeah, higher before. And let so me let me your own evidence tells Sanjay, us. Sanjay, that... let me answer your question. Yeah. Right now, credit ratings are incredibly low because there is literally a debt crisis in the developing world. Cool. The problem is here. Let me finish, and then I'll let you go. The problem is that right now there is basically no way for these countries to get out of this COVID crisis because there is no money flowing to these economies. The only way you can have money flowing to these economies is through external infusions of cash, whether that be through investors in the outside world because now credit ratings are increased because of the IMF or through things like SDRs, which okay. funnel money into these so countries. So the problem Go is, ahead. is that A, you're not looking at the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that let's look to the 60s. Back in the 60s and 70s, African countries had really high credit ratings. What happened then? In the 1980s and 90s, there was a huge debt crisis that plummeted them. COVID might have caused a short-term loss. And even then, we would argue that the austerity that the IMF is pushing on them is just making the problem even worse. But the bigger thing to analyze is the fact that the reason credit ratings are so low right now is because of the 1980s and 90s debt crisis that the IMF itself caused. So at best, you're just solving a problem that you yourself created with so the IMF. Or at worst, you're probably not even doing that. Let's think about solving the crisis right now and the crisis in the future. Because the fact of the matter is, is that unless we're able to solve the COVID crisis, nothing in the future will matter, whether it be economic reform or socioeconomic reform, sure. because we're in the crisis right now. So the best way yeah. to get out of the crisis is, is things like unconditional loans that don't require austerity, like SDRs. But yeah, that would be great. But, but really quickly, Sanjay, since you spent- of loans, Sanjay, 84% of loans have huge conditions. That's so first of all, that evidence about 84% says- not does not require it just says some might require but the second thing i want to point out or actually two more things we can, can give sdrs okay. which don't have conditions but on because we've spent two minutes on this can i have a question yep okay so on your first example about latin america you read me this evidence that says that in 1982 and 1983 there was these massive increases in poverty due to imf programs globally what was happening in 1982 and 1983 oh uh, do you want to tell me the 1981 financial crisis, the global Ooh. recession, started in the third quarter of 1981. So at okay. the same time that you blame the IMF for these increases in poverty, I don't think we blame. Have we IMF. seen these poverty increases anyway? Because there was a global no. recession. Look, sure, there's other factors leading to poverty. We're not blaming the IMF for all poverty. We're just saying that look, in Latin America specifically, our pastoral evidence tells you because the IMF caused a crisis in Latin America specifically, that led to millions of people. Even if there was a global recession during the time, even if there was a financial crisis, that doesn't negate the fact that the IMF was pushing millions of people into poverty then. But I think what I'm just fire. trying to point out is that this stuff would have happened anyway. I think the IMF alleviated it a bit, but you're right. That's cross. Uh, Sanjay, do you want to take prep? Yep. All right. It'll start when the call goes through.
All right, that was 115. The order is just going to be responding to my opponent's case. Is anybody not ready? Awesome. At the top of their case, they claim that the IMF is the international firefighter. But according to Shaw 13 of UMISH, even though the IMF is billed as a firefighter that helps address economic crises, IMF lending is attached with conditions that only exacerbate the root causes of poverty in developing countries. My opponents give you a lot of arguments in today's round, but none of them are particularly well developed. Let's go down the list. Starting on liberalization. My opponents tell you that liberalization is a great thing, and we would generally agree, but the reason IMF liberalization specifically doesn't work is because it's much too fast. UN05 finds that sudden liberalization without regulation hurts countries who are early infant stages of industrialization and development. That's why the IMF imposing sudden liberalization on developing countries who can't compete with foreign markets specifically eliminates the opportunity for gradual liberalization and prevents their domestic industry from developing. That's why historically the IMF forced Haiti to open its market to imported U.S. rice, which is why U.S. corporations sell 50% of the rice consumed in Haiti. Oxfam quantifies that as a result of international out competition, 1.6 million farmers were pushed into poverty and 90% of the people in Haiti lived below the poverty line. But then Pettinger 18 finds that this same rapid liberalization causes a reduction in domestic demand because international firms can easily outcompete domestic firms with greater productivity and lower prices, which is why Graham finds that countries that liberalize see huge increases in poverty for the, for the middle class with public sector jobs. On the argument about tax reforms, first of all, if this tax reform were really good, almost any economist or international organization like the World Bank would have get, provided the exact same advice. This reform could have happened any other way besides the IMF. They give you no reason why it must be the IMF. But then second of all, the IMF has historically implemented VAT taxes that disproportionately tax the poor. It is a regressive tax policy because VAT taxes spending, which is mostly done by the poor, which means that the, it exacerbates income inequality. That's why our bird evidence, which analyzes hundreds of, I, of countries that signed on with the IMF, finds that income inequality increased by 6%. But then thirdly, Forrester 19 finds that IMF policies call for fiscal consolidation measures that lower public sector wages or cause unemployment, which disproportionately hurts, hurts the poor. Thus, Conversation 19 quantifies that IMF programs in, in, increase income inequality by 6.5% per year. On the argument about ethnic tensions, a lot of responses here. First, regarding ethnic violence and conflict specifically, history is not on my opponent's sides. The IMF has actually caused ethnic violence in two countries. First, Beams 99 finds that in Yugoslavia, the IMF controlled economic policy and implemented devaluation, a wage freeze and price decontrol, which decreased government revenues, after which Yugoslavia saw huge ethnic violence and religious rivalry after they started cutting spending. Second, Maloney finds that in Rwanda, IMF conditions incentivized farmers to join the army and economic destabilization fueled social tensions, which led to economic and social conditions that started the Rwandan genocide. But furthermore, most academic studies disagree with their findings. Soisa finds in a holistic study, there's been no, no causal relationship between the IMF and findings of reduced ethnic tension. But let's move on to the argument about credit. Two responses here. First, Edward explains that moving to a tight money stance through IMF austerity mandates increasing the cost of capital for firms, which deters investors from spending in these countries because these businesses have to spend a larger portion of their revenue spending money on investment. But then second of all, Boss 13 finds that IMF participation signals to markets that a crisis is looming. He warns as seen as a surrendering a part of a na national sovereignty to foreign powers and that participation is a signal of weakness. But then are the argument about SDRs? Two responses here. First, Hill 21 finds that because there are no conditions on SDRs, even though the IMF wants the money to spend, wants the countries to spend money on things like vaccines, SDRs simply invite waste, corruption, and bureaucratic spending. Historically, Ford 21 finds that Lebanon has nearly $196 million in SDRs, but corruption led to the economy collapsing and increase, increasing poverty by 50%. But then second of all, more 21 finds that SDRs are allocated as per a country's IMF quota and voting share rather than its needs, which is why Barron finds over 75% of the assistance goes to developed nations like China who don't need the assistance in the first place. Uh, can I see the two responses on credit? Yeah, sure. Yep, I'll send those.
cool i sent the evidence Okay, we'll take some prep time. Okay, um, that was 103. Ian, can you be on the other call? Yeah. Okay, so the structure of this speech is going to start by responding to what he just said in his last speech and then going to addressing his own arguments on their case. Everyone good? Okay. Let's begin. All their arguments have a fundamental theme. The IMF was really bad in the past and does things like austerity and cuts. The problem is the IMF has since learned from its mistake. That's why now they're in issuing unconditional SDRs, loans with zero interest rates or conditionalities, and more progressive reforms. All my opponent's arguments they make in their last speech are already being solved back right now. But let's go to the specifics. They say that IMF liberalization is way too fast. The problem is that liberalization also benefits the domestic sector. It creates unskilled jobs, increases the incomes of the poor, and allows for multinationals to invest into wages, which is why they drop the pieces of evidence that indicates that investment goes up by 1.5%, and historically, 120 million people have been lifted out of poverty. They talk about VAT taxes and increases in income inequality, but this argument is also outdated because Elliot 20 finds that the IMF is now advocating for progressive taxes, taxing the wealthy instead, which is why historically the IMF has decreased income inequality by 18%. But specifically, our argument that we're going for is our argument about SDRs or special drawing rights. We explained that during COVID, the IMF is facilitating recovery by giving reserves to low income countries. They say that SDRs have corruption, but this isn't true. SDRs are just reserves given to, to countries during times of emergencies. There are other reasons as to why corruption would happen. If anything, we'd say that even if there's some corruption, the IMF has historically mitigated the 08 crisis using SDRs and it's increased healthcare spending by 45%. They say that 75% of SDRs go to developed countries. This is also outdated. We say that one, richer countries are now donating their SDRs to poorer countries, but two, they've conceded that these new batch of SDRs during COVID are less tailored towards wealthier nations and are more tailored towards poorer nations. Their entire narrative on their side of the flow is that social spending cuts from the IMF are devastating. The first thing to note is that these same problems would have happened no matter what. Countries that get IMF loans are in dire conditions anyways, meaning that austerity would have happened regardless of the IMF. If anything, we point out that the IMF is solving the problem because it is advocating for lending that facilitates social spending. That's why historically, Gary 11 finds that countries that get IMF loans have higher levels of health and education spending. Moreover, the IMF is now providing technical assistance to countries to invest into infrastructure and public investment, which is why it will create 33 million jobs and increase GDP by 2.7%. But fourthly, 
The IMF is allowing governments to increase progressive taxes, allowing them to generate revenue, which is then being used to direct money into public health care, which is why Gupta finds in 2017 that when you analyze the long term, the IMF increases public health spending by 1% of GDP every five years. They try to paint the picture that the IMF caused financial crises in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, but these arguments are historically incorrect. The Asian financial crisis, for example, happened because of currency devaluation in Thailand. The 92 crisis in Latin America, for example, happened because of a global recession. These are not happening because of the IMF. Instead, the IMF came in to fix the problem as they're providing debt relief to countries, which is why historically, after implementing IMF programs, debt is 90% lower. This means that countries have more capital and money to invest into things like social spending, which is why Johnson 20 finds that historically, after IMF implementation, social spending is five times higher. At the very bottom of their case, they say that 84% of COVID loans required austerity cuts. The problem with this claim is that if you look at the data set of their evidence, it indicates that in a wide range of countries over Africa, both healthcare spending and public health expenditure is going up during COVID, meaning that the IMF is reforming and solving the problem that they claim the IMF has created. For these reasons, vote affirmative. Can we see the evidence about social spending being five times higher? Yep. And rich countries donating their SDRs to poor countries. So just those two. Can we also see all the evidence? That, can we see the evidence they read about how social spending is five times higher? Oh, Sanjay, I already called for that. Just oh, okay. It. Yeah. My bad. The evidence is sent. Okay. Right. Cool. When we receive it, I'll be good for cross. All right. I think I just got it. So if you're ready, so am I. All right. Um, I'm ready. All right. Uh, I'll take the first question. Go ahead. So your OECD evidence about poverty decreasing by 20%, how many countries does it look at? I'm not sure, but we have gone, we're talking about our SDRs argument, which has historically saved millions of lives as per the main evidence. Can I have a question? Sure, go ahead. So you make a response that SDRs are less tailored towards low income countries. Are these low income countries economies smaller compared to large, like wealthier nations economies? Yes. So proportionally, how many, how much reserves do low income countries get compared to wealthier nations? What I'm saying is that during times of crises, lower income countries are probably worse off. So even if they get less money proportionately compared to the size of their economy, they should probably get more given that they would suffer more from the crisis and these developed countries who have fiscal stimulus who can actually recover from the crisis on their own. The reason why less of this money is going towards low income countries is because they have smaller economies. 
when you when you look at this proportionately, our evidence indicates that it is enough to increase reserves in low income countries by 20%. I understand what you're saying, but these developed countries already have social safety nets and stimulus packages with the reserves to actually recover from the crisis on their own without these SDRs. If these SDRs were really going to the people who needed it the most, they wouldn't be going to developed countries. Can I take a question? Go ahead. So on your argument about SDRs, um, you say that these conditions or that even though there's some level of corruption that they mitigated the 08 crisis, how much did these SDRs actually play a role in the 08 crisis? We have evidence that says that it played a significant role in the 08 crisis. And we've also evidence that says that SDRs are the single best way to mitigate the COVID pandemic right now. So how much did it mitigate the 08 crisis by? How much? Well, it like, what does significant by, role mean? Yeah, it increased healthcare spending by forty-five percent. It also, um, we also have during the 08 crisis. Yeah, yeah, in 08, increased healthcare spending by forty-five percent. We have evidence. I'd love that to it, see evidence for that, but you can take a question. Crisis. We also have evidence that indicates that SDRs are the single best way to solve the, for the COVID crisis right now. Sure, you can take a question. Okay, um, so you make a point that. Um, the IMF increases VAT taxes and increases income inequality. How are VAT taxes, how do VAT taxes work? Like what are VAT taxes? VAT taxes are taxes on spending. So essentially sales taxes. Like for example, uh, I think when Andrew Yang recommended it was taxes on uh, like every Amazon purchase. So in these developed, developing countries, the way it works is that whenever poor people need to purchase something, there's an, a value added tax. The reason so this is regressive is because- It taxes based on consumption, right? Yeah. So it functions as a tax on existing wealth because future, future consumption can- No, it's not a tax on existing wealth because wealthy people don't spend as much as a share of their income as the I poor. I understand. But the only way that you can tax consumption is if you tax wealth that already exists, meaning that VAT taxes are a progressive form of taxation. They tax wealth that exists for the people who are- because poor people still have the capital to spend, right? That's like- it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty absurd to assume that they don't have money to spend on like consumption, but that's cross. Uh, we'll just take some prep. Yeah, we'll start when we get on call. Cool. The structure of this speech is going to be starting on our argument and then moving on to their arguments. Is anybody not ready? Great. Starting off with our argument about cutting social spending, we explained that in exchange for loans, the IMF requires countries to cut health education spending by 25% and healthcare spending by 50%, historically proven in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, where they've completely conceded that disease mortality increased by 30% due to the IMF. That's why IMF programs have historically decreased economic growth by 40%, killed over 4 million people, and pushed 14 million into poverty, which is why just this year alone, over 500 organizations and 85 nations have shunned the IMF. Let's see their responses. 
the first thing that they say is that the IMF has learned from their mistakes. No, they haven't. They've only doubled down during COVID by putting belt tightening healthcare cuts that are destroying the developing world and costing a decade of development. Their second argument is that austerity would have happened anyway. But no, out the IMF made it uniquely worse by 25% on education and 50% on healthcare. Then they say that the IMF provides technical assistance to build infrastructure and create jobs. But this technical assistance is the same thing that's triggered financial crises across the globe. The IMF themselves have admitted that their approach is bad, which is that on net poverty is increased by 14 million. Then they say that the IMF has increased progressive taxes right now. That's not true. Our Oxfam evidence tells you that in COVID itself, the IMF is right now prescribing VAT taxes, which Aditya points out is progressive, is regressive and hurts the poor. This is empirically proven in Angola, Nigeria, and Malawi. Finally, they say that the, both the Latin American crisis and Asian crisis were caused by alternative factors, but that's fine. We're not saying that the IMF is to blame for all the crises, but rather that the IMF came in as a firefighter and mismanaged the crisis to do things like austerity measures that made it a lot worse. Finally, they read you a lot of evidence about how the IMF supposedly increases social spending, but all of their evidence, if you call for it, is from the IMF itself. And author Revan finds that these IMF authors often feel pressured to write only good about the IMF. Let's look to a non-biased third-party source that finds that social spending went down by 50%, historically proven in our Africa example that was completely conceded. Then they tell you that right now healthcare spending is going up, but that is not true. Our Oxfam indicates that no, there are deep cuts in uh, deep cuts to public health systems, even if there are unconditional SDR loans that accounts for 16% of the IMF's COVID loans. 84% of them have huge cuts, which is why the conceded Ambrose evidence tells you that these social spending cuts right now threaten to plunge countries into years of depression, which is why historically countries like Ecuador, Barbados, and Tunisia have suffered right now during uh, during COVID from these cuts. But even then. Let's go to my opponent's case where Dre drop all of their arguments besides their last one about SDRs. They have really not responded to our responses here. First of all, recognize the Hill evidence tells you that a lack of oversight of SDRs creates a huge amount of wasteful spending and corruption. They just say our evidence outdated, but our evidence from 2021 that finds that historically SDRs are leading to corruption right now that collapsed the economy and has increased the poverty rate by 50% in Lebanon. But second of all, Moore 21 finds that SDRs are only allocated as per a country's IMF quota need and voting shares rather than seed, which is that Barron tells over 75% of assistance go to developed countries. They, their evidence just says that they should donate, not that they have. Have, historically, it's only going to develop countries over 75% of it. History is on our side, not theirs. It is a very clear con ballot. All right, we'll take prep time. Yeah, I'll put my hand up when the timer's ready. All right, perfect. Let me just mute on the other call. And Ian, can you mute as well? Just to confirm, you guys have 15 seconds of prep left, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was 145. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, it's going to just begin with a, an analysis of the debate as a whole, our arguments going on to their arguments. 
Is anybody not ready? All right, perfect. Let's begin time now. Let's look to the fundamental global economy. As Sanjay even admits in his summary speech, to some degree, these economic crises are inevitable. So the question that you're going to be have to ask to yourself when you're filling out your ballot is, which side can best fundamentally solve the inevitable economic crises? The truth is, and the easiest place to vote in this round is going to be on our argument about SDRs. Our argument is unbearingly simple. During times of crises, the IMF gives tokens to developing nations. These developing nations can cash in these tokens for any sort of cash and use it to buy vaccines, restructure their economies, pay off debts, whatever they might need, which is why we explained that empirically, we were able to mitigate the 08 crisis, increase health spending by 45%, and on net save millions of lives. The reason this is going to be the most important argument in the round is for two reasons. First is the conceded evidence that Ian reads, which explains that the fundamentally best way to get out of COVID recession is through SDRs. And the COVID recession is the most important argument in the round. Because the fact of the matter is, when countries are in a COVID recession, there is nothing that allows them to do things like spend money on social spending, healthcare, and education. There is no money at all flowing through these economies, which means you need an external influx of cash. That is the only solution to the crisis they don't actually provide you a solution. That's something important to point out. Now, they give you two different responses. They both are fundamentally just ignore what Ian says in his rebuttal speech. First, they tell you that corruption happens all the time with these SDRs. But the problem is they just give you one example of corruption happening. On a wholesale empirical example, we tell you that on net, it was able to mitigate the 08 crisis and increase spending by 45%. So sure, it might've happened in one place, but in a hundred other places, it was critical in saving millions of lives. I think that's worth it. Then they say that these SCRs are allocated based on voting share. That's fine. Smaller economies get less money, but that's fine because it's enough for them to lift themselves out of recession, which is why it was empirically working in 2008. And in addition, the new 2021 SDRs are more tailored to poor countries. So that's even better. We're solving the problem best. Now, let's talk about their argument about social spending. Their fundamental argument is that the IMF is the big bad wolf because it mandates social spending and austerity cuts. The problem is what we explain is a couple of things. First of all, cuts aren't actually happening during COVID because the drop evidence from Keering tells you that 82% of COVID loans don't actually require any kind of austerity cuts. That's conceded. Another piece of conceded evidence is the Johnson evidence built on their own Gallagher evidence. What their own evidence says, not bias at all, is that on net, social spending is actually increasing in these countries. The reason is that the IMF is able to solve for things like debt and actually increase spending. They're saying that, oh, all these cuts happen, but they would have happened anyway. These countries are in global recessions. When you account for the cuts that would have happened anyway, on net, social spending increases by five times. That's Johnson, which is completely dropped at the end of the round. We're the best solution to the crisis. The IMF is fixing its problems now. It's very easy to affirm at the end of the day. Are you good for Grant? Yeah, I'm good. And you can have the first question. Cool. So let's talk about SDRs, right? Yeah. SDRs sound really good in theory. <laughs> they are. Really have good. they worked in Lebanon? They have worked Adisha, in Ethiopia. They've you, worked in the crisis. You give me one country in which $192 million okay. were spent. Wait, here, let, let me answer this question. One country mm -hmm. where $192 million were spent. The new mm -hmm. IMF COVID loans are $500 billion allocated to the entire world. Which but your argument been... isn't about COVID loans. Adisha, it's about SDRs. Adisha. Yes. $500 billion during COVID. You're right. They're not loans. I misspoke. This is really important because in the past, for example, in the 08 crisis, which is, again, not responded to by you guys, we were able to mitigate the crisis. We were able okay. to increase health spending by 45%, for example. These so empirics, in the 08 crisis, even if in one or two countries, yeah. they're not perfect, on a wholesale yeah, yeah. So global the scale, they've been crisis. very, very good. So in the 08 crisis, how much, what happened? Like, how much was it mitigated by? Because this is very uncontextual. It's just mitigating the crisis. Like, what does this mean? How many people out of poverty? You're not giving me any quantifications, any statistics in what countries it worked whatsoever. Okay, what, sure. what, what happened in the 08 crisis? So the in the 08 did? crisis, the IMF was able to allocate billions of dollars to these countries. I can give you a quantification on how much we mitigated because that doesn't make any yeah, sense. Like how, can't which countries, prove that at all. Which countries but what, I, what, happen, I, what I which, can tell which, you, is what one our country, is based on yeah, one country we, yeah go ahead Ian 
Yeah, one country you give is Ethiopia. Public health spending in Ethiopia went up by 45% because of the IMF. Yeah, yeah. And then, but in addition, you... let, let me finish something really quickly. What yeah. our evidence also indicates is based on the historical trend of the usage of SDRs, the fundamentally best way to solve for the COVID recession, again, not touched by you guys, okay. is through these yeah, SDR the allocations. Is that it doesn't matter if you're having these SDR loans when the 82% of the, 84% of the loans mm. have belt tightening austerity measures, which the Ambrose evidence that has been untouched throughout this entire round tells you I, that on net, account, can I, on net accounting for everything, it costs a lost decade of development. So, it's fine if maybe 18% of these. In fact, how many countries during COVID have gotten SDR so, loans? So, so, so three, three problems with that. First of all, SDRs are unconditional. No austerity needed at all. Okay. Secondly, I do respond to your evidence. Your evidence that says that 84% of COVID loans require austerity, A, doesn't say require austerity. Yeah, it, it, concludes, it's, it's let, me, let me finish, Sanjay, Sanjay, Sanjay. B, concludes at the end of the article that social spending is going up. And C, I explained that a better piece of evidence, which concludes okay, decisively that, that 82% don't require unconditional loans. Okay, so the you, problem you, is that- This that entire is thing wrong. is that, okay. So, so, so Sanji, that's why I give you the analysis yeah, that the yeah. IMF is reforming now. And so these SDRs the are unconditional. There are two competing arguments where we see that 84% of COVID loans have cuts. Mm -hmm. You say that they don't. But the that's when we look to the Ambrose evidence that does it. No, no, we look like to your net. own evidence, Sanjay, that yeah, concludes that spending Ambrose is because increasing. That's the one cut, that's the evidence that's been untouched. Wait, that means when that you say that our evidence says social spending, spending increases, it's it's citing your evidence. And the next line, it says no, that no, the no, evidence no, is flawed. The set of your own awesome evidence. It indicates that in 50 different countries in Africa, the IMF is now prioritizing health expenditure. Yeah, exactly. it's, citing a, it's citing one of your studies and debunking no, it's the it in the data next set line. that you're in 50 different countries in Africa and indicating that health yeah, spending is debunking. Uh, your we're study. well over time, though. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take our last uh, minute of prep. Yeah, time. we'll take our last minute of prep. Uh, I think that's your time. Yeah, that is the well, like 59 seconds. So yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. Ian, can you mute on the other call? It's going to be our argument about austerity and then responding to their case. Is anyone not ready? Perfect. We'll agree that we should look to solving the economic crisis, but that can't happen when the IMF is pushing huge austerity measures on these countries that destroy and contract their economies. Starting with our argument about social spending, we explained that in exchange for loans, the IMF requires nations to cut education spending by 25% and healthcare spending by 50%. This has historically happened in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, where as a result of these disastrous policies, disease mortality increased by 30% specifically because of the IMF. That's why these programs have historically decreased economic growth by 40%, killed 4 million people, and pushed 14 million into poverty, which why just this year during COVID-19, there's a reason why 500 organizations and 85 developed countries have shunned the IMF. They give you a couple of responses. Their first response is that 82% of COVID loans don't require cuts, but our Oxfam evidence says that no, 84% of loans do require these cuts and it's much more recent than theirs. They've conceded that these cuts have happened in Ecuador, Barbados, and Tunisia. That's why Ambrose tells you at the social spending cuts that were forced by the IMF during this surge of lending amidst the pandemic threatened to plunge these countries into years of depression and a lost decade of development. Their last response is that social spending is increasing 
increasing in these countries. But no, their evidence is from the IMF itself, ignoring hundreds of hidden variables and all of their finds that the IMF authors feel pressure to only write good things about the IMF. Let's look at the third party source that finds that social spending is cut down by 50%, historically proven in our Africa example that was completely conceded this round. In Africa, during the spread of HIV, disease mortality increased by 30%. That's conceded. Let's go to my opponent's case. My opponents claim that the IMF has learned from the past, but recognize that IMF has continued to make the same mistakes time and time again. Let's look at the COVID crisis. SDRs sound really good in theory, but in practice, they failed. Why? Because giving free money to developing nations creates corruption and bureaucratic waste, which they have conceded that SDRs have increased poverty by 50% in countries like Lebanon because the government mismanages resources, leaving the poor in the dust. At the end of the day, these SDRs are just a band-aid on the bullet wound of the financial crisis. Okay. Um, the, the structure of this speech is going to start on the SDR's argument and then go to their argument about social spending. Everyone ready? Let's begin. This round is pretty simple. The most untouched argument in the round is our evidence that indicates that the single best way to get out of the COVID recession is through a large issuance of SDRs or special drawing rights. Our argument is simple. SDRs are a token system worth $500 billion, allowing countries to trade in these tokens to cash to restructure their own workforce, recover from COVID, and save millions of lives. They have conceded that the COVID recession comes before anything else because these countries cannot worry about spending money on health and education if they're in a recession. If these countries are in the COVID recession, spending cuts and austerity is infinitely more likely. That is why SDRs come first in today's debate. The only response they make is that SDRs have corruption and bureaucratic waste. Two problems. One, this argument is not true. SDRs are reserves given to countries during times of emergency. There is no corruption associated with it. But even if you believe this argument to be true, it's not historically proven. We point out that SDRs have historically A, mitigated the OA crisis, and B, increased health spending by 45%. Even if it, if it didn't work in one country, it worked in hundreds of different countries during the 08 recession, proving that SDRs is historically proven to be true. Let's explain why their argument about social spending isn't true. They can say history all they want, but the IMF is reforming right now. That's why COVID loans do not have any conditionalities. They read an opposing piece of evidence that there are cuts required, but it concludes at the end of their article that the IMF is now prioritizing health expenditure. That is why our Gary evidence, which is by the way, not from the IMF, it accounts for selection biases and analyzes all of IMF programs indicates that on net, countries that get IMF loans have higher levels of health and education spending. They've also conceded the Johnson evidence, which indicates that the IMF frees up money for countries, which is why after IMF implementation, social spending is five times higher. The simple fact is that the IMF is now reforming their economies and getting out of the COVID recession is the most important impact. That is why we are very proud to affirm. Good round, y'all. Good round, everyone. Good Thanks round, for judging. Thank you for judging. Yeah, thank you Bye, so much everyone. for judging. Bye-bye. Good luck.